Okay. Uh, my name is Umavela. I'm a Spong. Used to be Mavela, Zamini. A lot of people know me about through that name, Mavela, Lot Zamini. That was the Lot was my what Christian name or whatever it is. But I don't think that the people who gave me the name even know and understand what it meant. But yeah, that was my name. A lot of people know me with that name, L O T, Lot. Um, born and bred. In this house, 10412 Hartebe Street, it's in Mzumthope. Um, you grew up knowing that my mother is my sister. Typical in those times, or people of my age and my peers. And grew up with a granny and the younger sister of my mum. Had a wonderful upbringing. I mean, it's a township. Uh, grew up sleeping under the table like any other person. I mean, that was normal in these houses. Uh, slept there till I think I got a little bit clever. Uh, and then I was given this room. But a small bed on the side. Then my aunt had another bed on her side, you see. So slept there till I was starting to be delighted. Then had to have him cuckoo at the back. Right. When did you become involved with politics? Politics in general, I started in 1980. I think it's 82, 83. I was at Orlando High School um, around that time, and I think it's 82. Yeah, I think it's 82, if not 83, when an organization that was called Azazim. Azanian student movement was sort of being formed or formed or something like that and I was recruited into that because just to be honest I was not the bright spark at school but also I was not the naughtiest but I was because around that period of time I think there were teachers that were sort of expelled for whatever reasons uh, because of they needed to change them or whatever it was, but then we had to have this sort of strike at the school. And uh, then they had brought in a Mr. Gunane, uh, who became a principal, but was generally an inspector. So when we were having all of these, then uh, I did something. I hope no policeman can look out and find that docket. <laughs> because I went out and then punched a sort of Use the knife. As a boy, it was naughty. Use the knife to cut his tires. And he, he couldn't leave the school. But that was that. It was then, then I think these guys felt that they need to direct um, that energy politically. Uh, but then, after that, I think in 1983, a friend of mine, Vosin Dombela, recruited me to what was then called the Congress of South African Students. Then I became an active member in that. Till uh, 1985, we all know, it was a bad year. Uh, there was boycott spearheaded by uh, Cossas. I was doing metric and we boycotted writing metric on, in, in, in that particular year. And I did not write. But also the reasons that I did not write was because of, by then, was recruited by a very much younger person to join MK. Uh, I'm not too sure how did he identify me or how did he look at my capabilities as a person or as an activist because quite active, yes, in course cycles I was. But we were amongst those that did not talk politics but talk. I was a very excellent stone thrower. That I can say today. Um, yeah, I was part of those that were troublesome when both Bishop Tutu and both Frank Chikan would say, members of the UTF, don't go out and go out orderly. How do you tell the youth? I mean, we're young, we're angry. How do you tell us to, to be orderly when 
all we wanted to do was commemorate June 16 or whatever that was happening at the time. And I mean, part and parcel of the system then was to attack. And uh, we were active and youth were being killed. Not only was the youth killed in 1976, youth was killed throughout uh, the period of apartheid. So we would go out, stone them, they'd take us, shoot us, whatever happened, and then come home and all of that. So I think this guy had seen this, and he then invited me to come meet uh, with two people. And may their souls rest in peace. One was Mudise. Matawane, one was Umatota. I'm not sure what happened. Umatota died later. He got himself involved in some criminal activity and all of that. All right, it's, a, it's quite a long story also, if I am to tell that. But then these were the first people that trained me in a house. It's quite interesting that today there's generals that uh, dispute that. I was trained in a house. I first saw my AK-47 inside a house, uh, about one, two, three streets down the road. All right? Yeah, in that particular way. Uh, the house is still there. We can go and can show you the house, you see. But it was, now it has improved. Present as it is now, but it was a normal forum house. I saw my first AK-47 there. I first saw my... Uh, RG25 grenade. Um, uh, RG25, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a offensive. Oh, I forgot these things. I'm, I'm quite. I think I'm getting old. <laughs> and then the scorpion using a chin gun. Those were the two things I first saw there. Three. And uh, had my first Makarov pistol. Then, 1985. And uh, can you detail the events leading up to your arrest? Okay. Uh, details leading to my arrest. My arrest comes in around 1987. But uh, before then, just so that we get committed and all of that as activists of MK Underground, uh, we had a few, we did a few attacks. There was what was called then councillors, who were collaborators with the system of apartheid at the time. So a lot of them were bombed around 1985-1986. Right? So up to until then. Then a lot of other things happen. When maybe time allows we can discuss that. I was arrested after coming back from exile. And I wouldn't say it's exile because with me I was already an operator inside the country. So because of that Mudise that had trained me initially had passed away. Mudise passed away with his brother on the 7th of April 1987 at a place called Fenterstock. There were four people there, two died, two survived. The discussion for survivors is for another day. All right. But I know details intimately. All right. Uh, there was also a policeman that died there. Another one was injured. All of that. So it was a shootout. Started around two, ended in the morning around five six. All right. There was no time to look at the watches. There was fighting. Moving from there, then I met up with another guy. I'm leading to my arrest. All right. To another guy that was Mushoshofi, and uh, he had a unit that was led by one Disco Mzalosa. All right, and meeting up with that guy also, we then continued with all our other operations as underground operatives. Then I had to go outside the country for further training and being in the ANC and be understood in the ANC as a member. So also there was a report that I had to submit uh, to O.R. Tambo himself, not to anybody. It was to get to O.R. Tambo. If he's not there, it was to get to Krisani or Joe Slovo. And uh, I remember in the presence of, of, of O.R. Tambo, 
Tabumpegi tried to take the race report and we had to wrestle with him. And uh, at the time we did not know better, but we did. But then OR then said no, they can organize that Joe Slovo can come from wherever he is to come take that. And that was it. And I left for a camp called Bango, that's where I was trained with a few other guys there and everybody. And then I came back into the country via Zambia into Zimbabwe, jumping the Zambezi River, and then walking all the way down to Botswana and then Francistown being picked up to, I think, somewhere next to Khaberon. Stayed there, then was made to jump into South Africa. But I survived, came back into the country to operate. Clearly did the operations, then I had to leave again, which was at the time wrong, but I had to because we couldn't connect with the front. Now when we speak of the front, we were sort of had what we had front commanders who were in the frontline states at the time. And we'd sort of communicate with them either for material or whatever ordinance that was required to continue waging war inside the country. So I left went and when we got to Lovasa, Botswana, I, I, I'm not sure if I need to say this, but then because of it impacts on what I'm going to say, is that it was picked up in Botswana by a present day today is a retired Major General Mashwala. Oh, funny thing happened, that's why I want to say this. But according to his car, was there in the was of the morning. He came around 3, 4. And we indicated that I've been calling the whole day. When I went into his car, he spoke to me in Afrikaans. He picked me up, we left, dropped me off somewhere else. Was picked up by a guy then, um, and a lady who I interacted with. And unfortunately, we got arrested in Botswana, Khabarone had to stay at the maximum prison and then we were deported I think after a week or so, seven days or so. I'm not too sure, but immediately I landed in Zambia. Was back on the Zambezi River. Onto a dingy, into Zim, walk all the way into Botswana, back in Botswana. This happened on the very day that I was deported from Botswana. So we're back, things were organized, and then I met up with a comrade I'd left with from the country. We jumped into South Africa, walked all the way, then we got into a roadblock. A funny thing happened at the roadblock, we were asked, but we were waiting for you two days ago. Where were you? So it was known that we were coming. So somehow we got arrested and uh, never in my life had I had such a pity. You see, um, this is the sad part because I was being beaten up by black people. By people I thought would understand. But these were part and parcel of the system of apartheid because these were collaborators of the system. They were from Buputatuana Defense Force. I'm not sure whether it's just their intelligence or special branch. I'm, I'm honestly not sure, I'm not interested, but God willing, I was hoping that I'll meet them one day. I don't know what I was going to do, but I, I can be honest. I don't think I would have been very nice to them because even today I'm, I'm not as healthy as I used to be because of those two guys. But be as it may, after that I think uh, my comrade sort of broke and they had to come back and then beat me, beat me up more because now there were three of us and I had not said that we are three. So now it means you know too much. So they had to deal with me, they dealt with me and in, in the dealings with me, they came in only 
English speaking white men. This was very odd for me because I had expected African speaking white men. And instead they came English and you could pick up the accent that this is English accent and nothing else. Okay, they came in, asked questions, they introduced themselves, they laughed together and all of that. They asked me a few questions. And then instead thereafter it changed. I was stripped naked, stuck naked. <coughs> These would be your handcuffs and you had to sit like this with these handcuffs because I was feet then you had to bend and then they'll put a broom between you and that that way so you'll hold on what was painful in that is that the handcuffs don't give you enough width to open up they were very painful here very very painful but then you had to answer questions and all of that with me they did not use two tables Instead, they would tilt it and I'll fall by the wayside. And when you fall by the wayside, one will stand on this part. And this part will be against the tiles. Believe you me, if you have never had so much pain, I can explain that pain to you. It's like somebody has put an, a red hot coal. That's the pain that I, I could explain at the time. But after that, then, uh, I think a day or two, or that day, I'm not too sure, I lost count of days whilst we were there. But we were also asked why we're here and everything, and who were we to meet with, you see. And uh, because of, I was afraid that whatever that I say, he will say, or oh, it will be different from what I'm saying. Then I kept to the things that I know he knows about. And I said, we're going to meet up with this Mshoshov. Uh, I think then there was an arrangement for us to travel to Johannesburg. We were picked up from wherever in Buputatswana. Small aircraft, stuck naked, blindfolded, flown into Soweto. But at the time I did not know we were being flown to Soweto. I only got these days after because of a young black policeman who was curious to know where were we coming from, from Lens side. And I couldn't understand why Lens. And then he said, no, you guys came through Lens flying sirens and all. Oh, okay. That's how I came to know this. He's, he's going to stop here. I'm not sure even with the noise. Is it still fine with the noise? Okay. So that's what happened. All right. But then they then went and hid me at Lenasia Police Station. And I didn't know I was in Lenasia Police Station. Up to until every morning and evening. Because there's a Muslim community in Atlanta. You'll hear the call to prayers. Yeah. And I would wonder, where am I? Because I, I was put into the cells that were in the inside of the police station. So I couldn't see outside and all of that. Lens is a place I would have known that, no, this is Lens. So, up until one day when food was brought in, and these guys that are in the police stations came in to give me food. I think this one policeman had sort of either did not follow procedure or whatever it is. Then I asked this guy, where am I here? He said, no, it's Lance. And I said, oh, okay. And once I wanted to ask him a question, he ran like hell to say, hey, I was told not to talk to you. You're a terrorist. You see, so I, I couldn't really find the explanation up until this policeman then explained that, no, you were at Lance and this, this, that. Then I can make the connection. That's what happened. But then after that period of time, we'd be, we'd be interrogated at a Protea police station or at John Foster Square, 10th floor. Those was how we'd alternate. If we're not there, we're somewhere at Zerast. 
But all of this now, I know that after the fact. At the time, did not know it. It was just, oh, okay. I mean, nobody talks to you, really. You, they come in, put on short steps, you hear, you go wherever. And how long, how long were you incarcerated for? Uh, at the time, you were in solitary confinement. Uh, in John Foster Square, you'll be all by yourself at the, at, in your cell. We'd make noise, we found ways. There was a guy next to us, now an advocate, advocate Jogan. Uh, he, he came up with a system of playing. Would sort of, I would stand on the window, open it up, and he'd open up his window, and then I would have my own chess set for two players, and then he would have his, and we would shout through the windows, and then we'd play all of that. That's how one maybe survived that. Well, uh, that's why may, maybe uh, one survives that. So I was there for nine months. We'd be taken out to wherever. Uh, they'll come in sometimes bring photos of people you don't know. Some of the people you know. Who's this? Who's that? You know, all of that. Sometimes they'll have a whole album. of people and uh, that's what happened up until we went to court no and behold we get to court after that period of nine months a guy I used to sleep next to in Angola comes in he's like yeah I trained with this guy in Angola that's it there were two of them they came in they identified the two of us with at the time defended by advocate Musaneke and he had chosen that not the two of us would be defense witnesses only me would then speak uh, I'm not sure what was the reason for that particular strategy but that strategy worked it worked excellently because we won the case which was not something that was normal then you see but it did work we won the case. They couldn't prove that we were trained outside. You see, even with those Ascaris. So, so that was that. And when we came out, it starts afresh. And when I wanted to go outside, I was told, look, we are legal in the country. Stay in the country. Work. Uh, I think that one is much, much longer. Uh, because I then continued to work with another comrade. Uh, um, his name was Kevin Musipiti. Long standing, excellent cadre of the NC. Excellent uh, skills and understanding of the underground. I think he's amongst the longest surviving cadres of the NC and MK that survived inside the country without detection. So, um, that is where um, we are at, yeah. Uh, there's another story about it when the guy that recruited me died, how they came here to kill me and I wasn't here, all of that, yeah. It's, it's quite a very long story. Uh, given your experience in the liberation movement and mm. how the current situation of the country stands with joblessness at an all-time high, also, the deficit in education between private education and public education and underfunded government programs. Do you think the, the ANC in modern times hasn't lived up to its historical mission, what you guys actually fought for? Well, that's a, a very long one and a very 